I'm up here today uh, to just share a little bit of my story and to really tell you that I am really no different than anyone in this room. We've been up on stage talking about all the things that we've been doing, um, but at the end of the day, I am just an average guy from Buffalo, New York. And last year this time, I was on the outside looking in. Imagine that those weren't those cool little startup healthy things over the door and there was like a, a budding young healthcare, CEO, well maybe not so young, but a budding healthcare CEO who was like peeking in being like, I wanna be a part of that. And so over the course of the next year, we set a goal, we said we're gonna join Startup Health and we applied and we got in. It's been an amazing experience, but now I get to be on this side of those doors instead of outside and it's been a real milestone for me. And it's uh, great to be up you know, on the main stage with you. And to tell you the truth, I was a little bit nervous. And so I was at home and I was rehearsing and I have to share this with you, my kids saw me rehearsing and so they wrote me some notes to start this thing off. So my son Ethan is nine and this is what he wrote. Daddy, good luck with your speech. Here is what I would say if I was you. Dogs do dog things. <laughs> If a dog does dog things, he's most likely a dog. And if he doesn't, it's probably a camel. <laughs> that was from Ethan. My daughter, Mira, said something kind of similar. Um, it's a little bit longer, but it had to do with a cat becoming a streetlight. So I'll leave that for maybe some parties tonight. Uh, but at the end of the day, you always hear how great it is to be the CEO of a startup. But the fact of the matter is, it's actually really, really hard. And so when I went through and I was practicing my speech, you know, to me, when I read those speeches from my kids, it was kind of like translating, you know, be up there, speak your truth, and um, tell people <laughs> sometimes how difficult it is to be an entrepreneur. But at the end of the day, nothing worthwhile is ever easy. It's probably a phrase you guys have heard a lot before. And uh, recently for me, and my board of directors is currently uh, on the live cast, and they're probably going to cringe with me being so vulnerable and sharing everything I'm about to share with you, but I recently had a deal blow up. We were out raising our Series B financing, we had a signed term sheet, and our deal blew up. And that's something that happens frequently as an entrepreneur. right? Entrepreneurship is it's about kind of waiting around in the dark, and when those things happen, you define yourself and your company by how you respond to them. And at the end of the day, I consider myself lucky. And that'll be a theme that you hear throughout the rest of this talk. I really consider myself lucky. Lucky to be up here on stage. Lucky even that my deal blew up and that it fell apart. And at the end of the day, you guys might think that's delusional, but I'm here to provide the evidence that in fact it's not. And this attitude that a lot of us have that everything's just gonna be okay is what needs to prevail to be a successful entrepreneur. Um, I told you before, I'm from Buffalo, New York. I was originally born in Cleveland, and my entrance to this world was uh, you know, pretty inauspicious. I was born with a broken collarbone, heart murmur, and jaundice. So I made a lot of noise coming into this world. That noise was crying. But, you know, go 12 years later, and I was just a middle-class kid in Buffalo, New York. And I really consider myself lucky because Buffalo was an incredibly normal place to grow up. And when I was 15, you know, every kid at that point is thinking about the freedom of driving. I said, this is great. I want to go out. I want to get a car. This is awesome. I went to speak to my parents. And they said, you want a car? That's fine. Go pay for it. I was like, what? Right? Um, so that was like life's first reality check. And so we started walking around the neighborhood. And we lived in this great part of Buffalo in the Elmwood District. And you walk up and down the street and there's a ton of different businesses that you can go work for. But you know what the high school job every kid wants is? Blockbuster video. No longer, rest in peace, blockbuster video. Um, you wanted that cool blue shirt, you wanted free video rentals, and it was a totally cush gig. But before I ended up walking into Blockbuster, I walked into a restaurant called Rigoletto's. It was an Italian bistro, and I walked in, I spoke to the owner, his name was Danny Viseri, and um, Danny at the end of that was like, yeah kid, we'll hire you. We always need dishwashers. There we go. Uh, and, uh, you know, so my first job was washing dishes. And I distinctly remember, and by the way, washing dishes, how many people have washed dishes in here as a job? All right, a little percentage of us, right? 
it is a tougher and harder job than what you're picturing in your mind right now. It's not like sitting there with a tub of joy and washing plates. It is sticking your hands into uh, you know, server carts where the server didn't tell you there was a broken glass and your hands are soaked and you end up coming out with cuts, right? It was jumping up and down in a dumpster in the middle of winter. And by the way, in Buffalo, if I add to the middle of winter of everything, that should help put things in perspective. It just heightens the drama, right? Everything's in the middle of winter because um, we really don't have a big summer there. But you're sitting there and you're jumping up and down a dumpster and some mystery liquid hits you in the face. You're like, what was that? But at the end of the day, that was a job that I ended up loving. There was something beauty, you know, beautiful about the simplicity of you work hard, you get your paycheck. And I remember how simple life was back then. Life now is like infinitely more complex. But there was something great about that relationship that was really interesting. Work hard, make a buck, end your shift, and go out with your friends. Um, but what it also taught me was that no job was ever below me. I know that no matter what happens in my life, I'm fine going back and doing hard labor if that's what it is, manual task, it doesn't matter. I know if I ever wanna take care of me and my family, that I'll be able to do that. And I think that's one of the things that kind of leads to a little bit less of a risk profile because for me, I've never been afraid to be a dishwasher. It was a job for me that I actually got a lot of, uh, you know, I took a lot of pride in, which much to the amusement of a lot of my friends uh, who didn't work at that point in time. But growing up in Buffalo is not a place where you can grow up with delusions of grandeur, right? It's cold, the, fa the steel industry there failed, the Buffalo Sabres never made the Stanley Cup, a bunch of phantom goals there, and the Buffalo Bills, oh my God, right? Four Super Bowls, no rings. Those were the four years I was in college, by the way. I did lose a little bit of money on those bets. Um, but Buffalo, as a town, has an intrinsically underdog mentality. And that's something that I really valued from growing up there, right? I've never expected to be first in anything, and it's always been the hard work that it took to get to wherever we were gonna get to in life. So in Buffalo, you grew up tough because, well, you had no other choice. After Buffalo, I went to college, and I went to college at Cornell, and I waited tables to pay my school expenses while I was there. Uh, while my friends partied, I got to learn the front of the house in the restaurant business. I think at some point in my life, I'll probably own a restaurant, want to do that, like start that up. Um, but one of the things that I thought was really interesting is what amazing training that was to be an entrepreneur in business, right? Try convincing a group of rowdy college students to one, pay their bill, but two, leave you, you know, a tip. And for a table of guys, forget it. Like I wasn't, you know, a hot waitress. I was like a geeky, you know, freshman college kid. Um, so you really learned that, you know, what they call servant leadership should really be called server leadership, right? Because that is what it's all about. And it's something I've, it, that's again, another lesson I've carried with me throughout my entrepreneurial career. I view my job as the CEO of our company to really make sure that everyone has the resources, the mentorship, the coaching that they need to succeed. If I end up doing their job, I've hired the wrong people and I'm doing the wrong thing, right? We're supposed to create this platform where people can thrive. While I was at Cornell, um, you know, and again, I consider myself very lucky to have been able to go there, there was a professor whose name was Professor David Ben Daniel, and he recently passed away, unfortunately, a few weeks ago, actually. And Professor Ben Daniel was the one who taught me that I could take an idea and make it real. And that's the core fundamental thing behind entrepreneurship. Take something that you're thinking about in your head and actually bring it into the real world. It's almost like a birthing process. And the second I wrote that first business plan, I was hooked. It, of course, was for a restaurant. It was called the University Brewing Company. I was going to do this really cool microbrewery. Um, but that was a really important thing to me. How do we take an idea and make it real? And when I realized, by the way, I was like the English history major. Any other English history majors kind of in the room, right? Show of hands. I was not the finance guy. I was not the accounting guy. I was scared of Excel. I'd never built a spreadsheet before in my life. But I realized if I was going to be an entrepreneur, I had to build that skill set. So I immediately went down the path of, uh, you know, trying to ensure that no CFO would ever pull the wool over my eyes. And I ended up going into a career in investment banking. And it was purely a means to an end for me, right? It was an opportunity to work with really smart people, opportunity to see how the C-suite operates, dig in on industries, see companies do it right, see companies do it wrong. Um, 
And you know, one of the things that I realized in, in going to visit these companies and being in their boardrooms was that not all C-suite execs are created equal, right? There are very smart people who are running shops and there are people who aren't as smart running $3 billion companies. And you just learn that and you learn that never walk in assuming that everybody in the room is smarter than you. Now, never walk in assuming you're the smartest guy in the room either. That's a dangerous recipe. Um, but it was something that I really learned um, while going through investment banking. And I learned how to tell a company's story. Because for me, all good business is about storytelling. You wanna raise capital? Tell a wonderful story to the market and really figure out how you're gonna position yourself. You wanna hire great employees? Create a company that has a story they want to be a part of. You want great partners? Gotta do the same thing. Right? Business is about high quality storytelling and having that story have meaning. Because at the end of the day, we're all in this room because we're trying to create something meaningful. At the end of the day, we're on a rock floating through space. We're trying to make life meaningful. Right? Um, so I learned how to tell a company's story. I learned that financial models help tell a company's story. And so I worked really, really hard, bashed my head against the wall to learn accounting and finance and how to financially model. And I ended up becoming a little bit of a modeling geek. Like we used to compare who could create the coolest financial models. And by the way, when you're doing that at three o'clock in the morning, you might think it's cool, but the next morning you're like, what were we thinking? Um, and it was really interesting. I got to work at Lehman Brothers. It was a place where I got to apply my creativity. Um, and I, again, got to see companies do it right and do it wrong. But eventually I ended up transitioning back to the entrepreneurship side. And yay nepotism for giving me the opportunity to do so. I had a gentleman who was my uncle, his name is Dr. Irv Edwards, and he had founded a company called Emergent Medical Associates. And EMA was an emergency room physician group. And I feel so lucky to have had this uncle in the family who was willing to take a shot on his nephew because, well, doctors don't know a lot about revenue, EBITDA, cash flow, strategy. They don't teach you guys that in medical school, right? They don't teach doctors how to manage their own practices. So for me, it was a great opportunity to apply my trade and learn healthcare at the same time. And over the next you know, 10 years, eight, nine years, we built the company, Emergent Medical Associates, from a $12 million group into a $130 million multi-specialty multi group. Right? And I consider myself lucky to have had that experience. I'm also lucky because during that time, I met the founder of a company called Language Access Network, which was a distressed company at the time. His name is Andy Panos. He's sitting right there. Everyone say hi, Andy. Hi, Andy. Hi. All right, see? That's the energy thing, right? You give energy to each other through doing that. Um, and Andy had this amazing vision where he wanted to solve healthcare disparities. And he had tried to build his company for five years, had challenges doing it. We met and immediately hit it off because I loved the vision. I loved the idea of what Andy was trying to do, which was called video medical interpreting. And it was bringing an interpreter to the point of care so that limited English proficient and deaf patients had an, a, an equal shot at having the same standard of care so you could improve outcomes and do all those different types of things. I'm also very lucky that over the course of the next six or seven years, we took Language Access Network, turned it into Cloudbreak Health, and now Cloudbreak Health is doing 75,000 encounters a month at over 700 hospitals over our unified telemedicine platform. But the most important thing I learned about working with the team was that the success wasn't about me. It wasn't about me, it was about the clients that we were serving, the care that we were enabling, and the broader story. And it was about making healthcare human. So physician burnout is the number one issue in the market right now when it comes to providing quality healthcare. And 50% of the doctors you see are suffering from that burnout. So the mission to be able to go out and help solve that problem, restore a little bit of the joy of calling back, we feel lucky to be able to do that. And we lead a whole dialogue about this at the hashtag Humanize Healthcare on Twitter. I invite you all to join us afterwards and you know, tweet away to the Humanize Healthcare hashtag because um, it's an important dialogue for us to be having. So at the end of the day, if you can see dishwashing as a lucky break, a really lucky break, then you might have the right mindset to see more than just tedium, broken glasses, and suffering through your shift. And if you can see obstacles and failure as stepping stones instead of game over, then you can be lucky too. And 
there's actually been some research that's come out of England by uh, a Richard Wiseman. He says, people who feel they are lucky actually physically see the world differently, right? So I encourage everyone in the audience to think about themselves as lucky because at the end of the day, healthcare is infuriating, right? We all work in it. It is probably one of the most frustrating industries we can all take part of. It's not hard some of the time, it's hard all of the time. Whether it's ever-changing regulations, risk-averse cultures in healthcare systems and it pairs, um, overwhelming complexity that patients can't even navigate the system. But you know what? That's what makes us lucky. There is a problem to solve. And the health transformers, funds, VCs, payers, providers, everybody in this room can have a chance to really make a difference. Because if healthcare was so great, would it need transformers? The answer to that is no. The more complex it is, the more effed up. Can I say that on stage, effed up? That's cool, right? Uh, the more room there is for innovation. And most importantly, the more important all these moonshots that you guys are hearing about today become. And it kind of reminds me a little bit of a scene from Dumb and Dumber, right? Where Lloyd finally gets to tell Mary how he feels. And he goes in, he's like, Mary, what are my chances? Mary looks at him and says, hmm, not good. Lloyd being a good negotiator, kind of stood up and said, that's great, I really want to ferret this out. Not good as in one in a hundred? Now Mary just wants to be candid at this point. She's kind of had enough of Lloyd. She's like, more like one in a million, right? Lloyd initially looking crestfallen. All of a sudden you see his lips curl into a smile and he's like, so you're saying I've got a chance, right? Now maybe we shouldn't be taking business lessons from a movie called Dumb and Dumber. Maybe that's not the smartest thing, but if I haven't heard a more, you know, batteries included focused answer from an entrepreneur on a challenging situation, I mean, that is the prime example of one to me. So if you're a healthcare entrepreneur, you're, you're facing intimidating odds, never solved before problems, tons of failure, it's busted deal processes, systems that go down, clients who never really recognize the value that you provide. Um, even though you're bending over backwards, and I think there was a wise Jedi Knight who once said, at least in the latest movie, the greatest teacher failure is. Was that not, not a good Yoda imitation? <laughs> um, because look, at the end of the day, ideas matter. But how many times have you been in a room where someone said, I've seen that, I, I had that idea 10 years ago, but you know what, they didn't execute against it. And so you know what matters more? Practical execution. And execution is hard. It's a long, dark night with just subtle moments of sunshine that peek their way through as you start to fight the way through it. And the way that I've always gotten through it is that in the seas of why not, I always search for the why. I just need one why. You give me one good why, and I am running down the path full steam ahead. So always search for the reason why something will succeed, because at the end of the day, nothing worthwhile is never easy. And as an entrepreneur, living in that negative space is really difficult but you need to live in the negative space without the negative mindset, right? So and there was a quote that I heard about it the other day. It was like, being positive in a negative situation isn't naive, it's leadership. So back to Lloyd and his one in a million chance. At the end of the day, it's really important to dream big. We've been talking a lot about moonshots and I dream big. I'm like, I drink the Kool-Aid, right? Like we're here dancing around at Startup Health. Like that to me is awesome. I love that stuff. I'm no longer jaded to all these activities that we might see where someone's like, well, I'm not gonna step into that. I'm a yes guy now, I step in. So I'm like the Kool-Aid dealer, right? I'm the Heisenberg of Kool-Aid for you Breaking Bad fans. Um, but at the end of the day, I really believe this company is the vehicle to deliver on my mission and impact millions of lives and that of our team. We really wanna change the face of healthcare and we've already served two million patients nationwide doing it. So at the end of the day, Right? You don't need exponential technology, as amazing as that is. You just need a simple idea and a desire to want to fix things. And for me, that was the mission to humanize healthcare. And there's a whole, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the whole pink socks movement that's out there, um, but that was a simple idea started by a guy named Nick Adkins, who's probably in the house today. And the whole idea was getting people together who want to change healthcare, right? However they wanted to do it, it was up for them to interpret. But that's the type of Kool-Aid that I drink now and that I deal to other folks. So, if a middle-class kid from Buffalo can believe that everything can be okay, 
I hope that you guys can too and participate, be active participants in making it okay. Because at the end of the day, that might be Pollyanna. You might call me an optimist. I've been called a lot of names in life, but I hope what it makes me is a health transformer. Thank you guys for your time.